Well, welcome to Emerald Hill Skies. It's a bit of a learning curve tonight because we're actually uh, streaming tonight from out here in the observatory. And this is the first time ever in history that we've done this. So I have no idea really what we're doing. I'm gonna call the uh, YouTube video up on my phone in hopes of uh, being able to uh, figure out if I'm at all even live. Okay, so it looks like I'm live. Um, now that the tough part is I don't have my nice little screen out here to show me what you guys are saying. So I'm gonna have to use my phone for that. It looks like Stu was on first. And uh, Stu says it's been over a month, but not that I'm counting. <laughs> uh, I'm not addicted, I could quit anytime. <laughs> you guys are great. Yeah, it has been a month, but believe me, I've watched the silly, uh, what's it called, the open sky deal regularly to try to find a clear night. And there's been not one clear night when I've been in town. I have been out of town a week or two. There's Tiffany. Uh, she's saying she went through withdrawals. You guys are too nice. Tiffany, greetings to you. You're very kind. I, I see a great picture of your dog there, the Shih Tzu. Uh, let's see. Stu says hello and says thanks, Doug. You guys are too kind. Honestly, you're, you're too nice. Uh, the dog is in your lap. She digs the universe. <laughs> Joy is the dog's name, okay? Uh, Bull Mastiff. That's what Stu had. Ricky, good to have you aboard. And um, okay, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna have to grab my phone every once in a while because I don't have my normal, you know, iPad here to watch. Um, let's see, my name's Doug. We're coming to you tonight from the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky at a place called Emerald Hills, a little 61 acre campus that's owned by the organization that I lead. And uh, tonight, we're out here under the open skies with our Ruloff Roof Observatory. And let's see if I can show you a picture of, there are the open skies. And you can see the, um, the screen off in the, in the corner there. There's my hand kind of waving in front of it. So that's the screen. And then you're looking up past the telescope up into the sky, okay? So there you go. Now this view is a little uh, webcam I've got mounted on the wall. So um, that way you can at least know that I'm not faking it and I'm inside. Um, so you've seen the scope. Now here's the sky tonight. It is a beautiful night. There, there appears to be just a, a little bit of haze. And I wonder, could that possibly be from the um, from the wildfires up in Canada, or is that impossible? That, that's a crazy idea, isn't it? It appears to be just a little haze. Kim, good to have you aboard. Poison apple, yes, supernova, let's get to it. Um, let's see. So we wanna go to this picture. Boy, that's kind of ugly, isn't it? Look at all the stuff. Kind of just, I'm sorry that that's so ugly. Let's see. Um, well, I'm gonna leave it for a second over there and just grab um, this screen. And here in the middle, you can see is the, is M101. And do a color balance again, just to be sure. Those greens look a little bit nasty, don't they? Why are those greens up so high? You think that's because of the strange stuff from my screen, you think? I 
wonder if that's because my screen is flooding it out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to my screen and I'm gonna try to um, set it on, um, what is that called? Um, I'm gonna just for a minute set it on, what is it, night light. Boy, that, that affects it for you guys as well though, doesn't it? Rocky, good to have you aboard. Yeah, that's gonna make everything red, but I just wanted to see if that straightened it out. I don't think that's helpful. Let's go back to, um, let's don't use that night light after all because that's just odd color, isn't it? Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of that screen, which is this, I think, yeah. Um, let's do another color balance. Boy, it just looks like the, um, the crest of those there in the histogram the crest is such a narrow niche of light, why would that be? Is that a sign that, I'm gonna move the whites over here. I'm gonna bring the mids up a little bit more. All oh, that green. Anyway, this is M101, Messier 101, discovered by um, Messier's assistant. Now here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this is that supernova right here. See that bright light and that trailing arm? There's the normal star I think we can see. I wonder if I can um, find a, um, oh, I'm sorry for that blinding light. I wonder if I can find a picture that I took of M101 earlier There we go, and let's go to M101, let's see, 2020, here's one from March, 12 frames, 240 seconds, that shouldn't be bad. So now, wonder if I should try to open that with uh, this ear fun view thing, however you pronounce that, ear fun view, open with ear fun view. Aha, uh -huh. that's awful. Now let's bring that up. Now let's expand it. Whoop, what happened? It went to the bottom display for some reason. Why is it jumping down at the bottom display? That's crazy. Uh, I have running two screens here. And uh, when I make it too big, it's jumping down to my other screen. So I'm going to close it again. It should be, I hope it's highlighted. I'm just going to, yeah, there we go. Let's try this one more time. And I'll, I'll be a little more careful about how I open it. Open with your fun view. There we go. And uh, I'm just going to make it bigger here first. Now I'm going to be more careful. I guess when it starts to go off the screen is when it jumps down. Okay, so see, out of that trailing, that's not. M101, that's M51. Why is that mislabeled? Let's go to then, here's one from May 2022. 
open with your fun view. What I'm trying to do is get a reference scene. Now that's kind of ugly, but at least we can see. See how in these trailing arms, there's like that one star and then these little, looks like a, a little trail of stars. Now let's go back over to our live view. Uh, here, hmm. that's very greenish, isn't it? That's better. Or maybe out here. Oh, there's that star. And then that little trail. So on the opposite side. Well, let's tackle this a different way. We're not going to be able to use one of my pictures. Let's go to the web and uh, let's see right here. And let's go to M101 Supernova. What is it? It's got an IX in it, doesn't it? IX something, right? Supernova May 22nd. 2023. Um, oh, so where? Wow. So it's in one of the closer trailing arms that flattens out. I hope you guys can see that. There's the closer trailing arm, and then it's a brighter star in that collection. Okay, let's go back to the live view again. Here's the live view. Let's zoom in a little more. That's at uh, 115%. And let's, that's 55 frames, 18 minutes. So a closer arm, so here are three stars and a very shallow, I'm going to see what you guys are saying here. Uh, this one was first spotted with spiral arms, the pinwheel galaxy by Japanese astronomer Kochi Itagaki on May 19th. Itagaki, an avid supernova hunter, has discovered more than 80 of the stellar explosions using his observatory in the mountains outside Yamagata, Japan. How's everyone feeling about the Beetlejuice hype? Uh, Poison Apple asks. Stu, I say bring it on. We need a second sun in the sky. Tiffany, sure be next. Need to see it if it happens. I'd love to see it go, but I'm worried about whether or not we'd have adverse effects from it. Where won't you? I'm curious how bright that would be. Supernova 2023 IXF. Top left is what Stu thinks. Um, let's see if we can bought that, but I think it might be on one of these. Oh, yeah. Let's look for this and then that trailing exhaust plume. Um, so let's try to let's take this picture and put it beside our picture. Now let's try to see some commonalities here. Let's see. It's such a close up view of it, isn't it? Hmm. <laughs> Hmm, such 
such a beautiful picture. What is this done with? This is done with a um, Craig Stocks. He doesn't say what he's what he's used here, does he? This is a beautiful picture. This looks like hours and hours of data, and it's very close in. Um, so let's see, there's a trail here, and then this trail takes a turn. So could, look at these. Let's see, we've got a wider view here, don't we? He's got a very close can we back off some? Hmm. Back off. Let's try a different a different view maybe. Compare the live view to the photo you've taken in the past when we saw it last. Right. Oh, that's a, a video. Oh, here we go. This is a little bit wider view. Okay. So here are two stars at the end of a trailing arm. And look, here are two stars at the end of a trailing arm. Can you see? Yeah. Here are two stars. So I think... There's a chance that these two stars are those two stars. So as this comes in, where's the pointer that shows us where the supernova is? That's the question. There. So if those two stars are these two stars, then look, 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 look. Here are these three stars with two stars, and look, there are those three stars with two stars. Now we're, we're getting somewhere, so let's repeat this. So halfway in, right there, Boy, it has dimmed, hasn't it? So it should be right here. So you guys seeing this, right there where that's blinking, can you see that blink? That's the supernova. This was taken on uh, May 20th and see these three stars here and a couple stars there so we have those three stars here and a couple stars there there's a star and here are those oh yeah look i wonder if that's it then Yes, I was getting disappointed because I thought it had dimmed. That's it right there. See, because look, here's a star there and a star there and a star there with the supernova makes a triangle. You guys make that out? Here's that triangle. And here is that triangle. And just to, to prove it, there's that star above the triangle, the reference star. So that's the supernova. Okay, so now let's get rid of this, or at least send it to the back. Uh, yeah, like that. Now let's send that to the back. This is the supernova right here. Boy, it's fairly bright, isn't it? Wow. Look 
at that. Now that's at uh, 64, I put it at 100%. So that's 100% of our um, ASI 2600MC Pro. Now where is M M101? Let's go to Stellarium so you can kind of see where we're looking. Uh, here would be North. And of course, there's the Pole Star, North Star. And then here's the Big Dipper. Notice how it's pointing. It's pointing to the, um, these two pointers point at the North Star. Now let's go up the handle. And now in between the last two stars at the handle, let's go out toward the meridian. So we're looking at the part of the sky here, right there. We're looking at this part of the sky in between the meridian and the last two. So there's Mizar. And this makes a kind of a triangle with the last two stars. So let's go over to the sky cam. And now in my upper display here, can I go to the sky cam? Yes, I should be able to do that. Uh, here's the Big Dipper, and here are the last two stars of the Big Dipper. So we're looking right here, and that's going to be the location of M101. Okay, now let's go back to our live view right here. And there's the supernova, and you are seeing history. So let me see what you guys are saying about this. SN2023 IXF. It's still getting brighter, too, so it'll be more visible than the photos online. Tiffany in the Shih Tzu says, wow, that's the one you said first. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Maybe, maybe you're right. <laughs> okay, so how are we going to uh, note this and find this again? I guess... One thing we could do is take a screenshot of this and in our screenshot we'll go something like that and let's see I'm going to Boy, how do I save as, this is off camera I know, but uh, off your screen. What I'm doing is I'm going to the place where I save all these and I'm going to say M101 dash and I'm going to put the 28 minutes but we didn't need nearly that long. It's a 28 minute compiled exposure of stacked screens that are 20 seconds long each. And I'm gonna say um, 2023 0616, that's the date. And then I'm gonna say with, I'm gonna put the word with, S, SN 2023 IXF and save that. Now, let's, let's bring that up in some kind of photo editor. M101. Oh, where did I just put that? M101, here we go. Um, M101, 28 minutes, here it is. And I'm going to open that up in that earphone view thing because I feel like that's one of the best. Okay, so right here, are you guys seeing that? Let's see. Let me go back to 
Boy, this is such a different world out here. I don't have my little... Um, let's go to the screen again. I don't have my little... Um, what's that called? Uh, stream deck? And it lets me push a button to get to the right place. Here, here is that... Um, how do I draw on this? I don't think I can now that I think about it. Not an earphone view. What about just normal paint? What if I bring it up in paint? I'm going to say open with paint. Now. Bring that up here. Apologies for how bright that is on your eyes. Now, I should be able to um, annotate this, shouldn't I? Shapes, like maybe draw a line. And draw a line like, of course, the line's going to be in black, isn't it? color. I need to put the line in white. Is that going to draw white? No, nope, that drew black. Well, how do you make it draw white? Gang? You, you guys know more about this stuff than I do, I bet. White. Still black. Unless, no. Well, rats, how do you change the color? I'm going to look down here and see if you guys... We're on Skycam. Well, by now, I think you should be on... Um, you're back to screen again, I think, by now. Somebody tell me how you set the color of this. Now, that's black, but this should be white, right? Oh, here we go. Now, uh, I need a line. Line. There we go. Okay, now we're making progress. Now let's save this. And um, okay, so now we've got a record of this, right? Cool. So you guys have seen a supernova uh, live, and let's go back to the sky cam. So again, you're looking at the basically you're looking at the end of the handle of the Big Dipper. So I'm going to go to that so I can point at it. Um, just find the Big Dipper and follow the handle out. And then when you get to the last two stars of the handle, just go up in a little triangle. And right there, if you could see M101, if you go to a really, 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 really super dark sky with binoculars and you look in that spot, then you could at least see a hazy patch above those two stars at the end of the handle pointer. And if you were to do that, uh, we're looking up in the sky tonight. If you were to do that, you'd at least be able to see that hazy patch that represents M M101. Now you couldn't see the star that is the um, the supernova. I think uh, somebody said it's around uh, 15 magnitude, and the limit of the magnitude with our eyes is like usually, what? Five or six, five or six, depending on your eyesight. So you wouldn't be able to see the supernova, but at least you could see this hazy patch. And what that hazy patch is, it's the accumulation of all of these, all of the material in this galaxy in a combined magnitude that's barely discernible, especially if you get binoculars, 
you could see that patch and you could say, well, that supernova is inside that patch. Uh, but here with the, this is 11 inch, 11 inch Rasa telescope. Uh, most of you all are familiar, but if, if this is your first time, there's a, a snapshot of the Rasa and it's in this observatory. There's a snapshot of the observatory from outside on another night. And that's a pure tech two observatory with a, a pure tech adjustable height pier that it's sitting on. And uh, it's, I'm using the, um, I'm using an ASI 2600 MC Pro camera on the end of that Rasa. Let's see, do I have, hmm. no, that's the, I was thinking I had a picture of the Rasa on the end of the scope, but I guess that's it. It's the ZWASI 2600 MC Pro, and uh, it's a live shot that you're seeing here, right there. So we'll always remember this night, right guys? According to a recent study based on data from the Chanda X-ray Observatory, supernova would have to be within 160 light years of Earth before we would feel its damaging effects. Well, that's a good thing. Another exclusive for you Northern Hemisphere dwellers, I'm afraid I have only this way to see it. Thanks, Doug, Stu says. Well, Stu, we're very grateful. Are there any other facts we should say about this uh, supernova? I think it's noteworthy that it was discovered by an amateur. And this is in spite of the fact that we have now professional, uh, like, deep sky imaging cameras that are studying the night sky every night in huge swaths trying to find supernovae. And I think it's, uh, isn't it kind of like, um, I don't know, it's sort of like gratifying that this could be discovered by an amateur, uh, an amateur, instead of all those fancy robotic automatic scopes that don't have anything to do with real people. I think this is awesome. So how did a supernova form? Well, my understanding is that First of all, you have to have a really big sun. You have to have a really big star. Our sun isn't big enough to generate the gravity that would make a supernova. You guys correct me if I'm wrong. Stu, you might be able to see this in some data somewhere. But if I remember right, a star has to be like 15 times bigger than our sun before it has enough gravity to be able to do the property that turns it into supernova. So what, ha what happens? When it gets near the end of its life and it's exhausted all of its, what is it? It, what are we, we're, we're burning hydrogen and forming helium, right? I forget. After it's burned up all of its elements that it's burning, I think it's hydrogen, um, then the star sort of like starts burning whatever it can find. And the stuff that it's burning is no longer enough to be able to make it a traditional star. And so the, the star kind of shuts down and it collapses down. But when it does, it, it compresses so small, I mean tiny, that it explodes in like this last breath of dying energy and that explosion can be so bright that as you can see in this picture, it is outshining the core of the galaxy. And the core of the galaxy is filled with perhaps thousands or millions of stars equivalents. And the fact that that explosion was bright enough to outshine the core is just amazing. Uh, 160 light years, Stu says, that you'd be able to feel effects from it. An exceptional discovery by a very experienced and very dedicated amateur astronomer. Good point, Kim. So when this explosion happens, typically what happens is it's visible like for maybe a matter of a few weeks. This is not like blip on and then it goes out. It and, and because it's expanding and getting brighter and brighter and bigger and bigger, 
it's visible for a few weeks. And the one we always hear about was the one, what? You guys remember the story back in what? Is it 1100 AD? And Chinese astronomers documented it. And they documented the location. And here we are now, uh, what? 1100 years later or whatever, 1200 years later. Is that right? No, 1100 AD. And we're at 2300. Right? 2023, yeah. So, so now a millennium later, all we have left of that supernova that they discovered is M1. The, the, the shell of gases that are barely discernible. It's like the carcass. It's the carcass of the supernova. And this supernova will only be visible probably to us for a matter of a few weeks. Now, here's another interesting fact. Isn't this galaxy like, isn't it like 50 million light years away, if I remember right? So what that means is this supernova didn't blow up in May, May 20th or May 22nd. It didn't. It blew up 50 million, 50 million years ago. And the light from that explosion started traveling in our direction 50 million years ago. And it has traveled all this way, 50 million light years. And we're seeing it as if it just happened last month. But in reality, the explosion happened 50 million years ago. Uh, now, this is a big galaxy. It's like, uh, if I remember right, it's like twice as big as the Milky Way galaxy. And as galaxies go, this one is one of the more beautiful. I mean, you gotta admit, it is, uh, it has like that grand spiral form, but there are a lot of star forming regions in this galaxy. And we know this because of all those kind of like uh, misty foggy areas in it. And so it's not surprising that it would generate supernovae, huh? Because it's producing a lot of stars. This is probably the longest picture we've ever taken of anything. All right, let me see if you guys are saying anything else here. These stellar explosions occur when stars, some 8 to 50 times more massive than our sun, run out of fuel, collapse inward, and finally explode in the incredible bursts of energy. In just 10 seconds, a type 2 supernova, which is what this is, this is a type 2, can release as much energy as our sun will throughout its entire lifetime. Uh, Stu says 21 million. So it's 21 million light years away. It's been journeying toward us for 21 million years. And Stu uh, noted here that in just 10 seconds, it can release as much energy as our sun released throughout its entire lifetime. Okay. Well, this is probably enough on this supernova, but this is a big deal. And I'm really glad you guys were able to be with us today and see it. I'm just going to walk outside, I think. I'll take my phone with me. I'm going to walk outside, I think. And that'll let me look up and see the Big Dipper without all this, all the, um, the view of the... I'm going to walk around on this wall and hope that you guys can hear me. Of course, we're having to go through the aluminum, but I, I'm going to look up in the sky at the Big Dipper and I'm just going to appreciate for a minute that I'm looking up and seeing the spot in the sky where a supernova blew up in my lifetime and I'm looking at the same spot where it is. Now, can you guys still hear me out here? Can you hear? I'm curious if my wireless mic works out here out here six billion years worth of light in 10 seconds wow anyway it's beautiful i'm curious if you guys will be able to hear me okay i'm going to come back in in case you lost me Okay, so could you hear me when I was outside the observatory or does the, 
does the wireless mic drop out? This is my first time. Oh, good. So you can hear me out there. Uh, this is my first time to operate out here. And I want you to know it's really kind of fun. Uh, I'm able to see you guys on the phone. I'm able to see your comments here. I'm able to uh, see the same thing you're seeing here on the screen. And uh, the telescope is right behind me. So I can look up through the roll off roof. Remember, here's what the observatory looks like. And I'm over there on that opposite side working on that screen that you see mounted on the wall. Um, so now I can, I can look up and I can see the sky above me. And I can see the brighter lights, the brighter stars. So I can probably, oh, there's Big Dipper right there. And there are those two handles. I didn't have to go outside after all. Um, so I'm able to see probably uh, with the light of the screen glaring at me, I'm still able to see maybe, um, I would guess, 100 stars maybe. Not more than 100, though, because of all the light from the screen blotting me out. So here in the observatory, uh, maybe you guys can see we've got a ladder. And this way I can go up. And the one thing that I have to focus manually on the scope is the the sky cam. That, that doesn't have an automatic focus on it. But I tell you, here's another problem I'm having. The focuser on the Rasa has, for some reason, lost connection with my ability to automatically focus it. So we're just riding on the focus of where it was last. And thank goodness it was close enough that we could get this picture tonight because I could not get the, uh, the, the focuser to be able to connect so that I could autofocus. So I have to work on that. There's always something to work on, isn't there? Anyway, uh, let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Let's do a picture up here. Save exactly a scene. And so we'll have that one as well. Tiffany, you're kind. 21 million years ago in our lifetime. Stu says, you can hear me outside. Kubota man Dan, hear you. OK. Well, that's good to know in case we do other stuff outside someday. This is my first time out here in the observatory doing this. All right, so let's let's do this. Let's, let's see if, um, let me go over here to um, Stellarium for a second. And I don't even know if M1 No, M1's below the horizon, but I was going to show you that carcass of, um, of a supernova. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's just go look at that quickly on the web, just so we connect the dots with what happens after the, the thing dies. So we're going to go to M1. Messier one and let's look at this picture so this is the carcass of a supernova and this is the one that Chinese astronomers saw in 1100 AD and after all of the furnace the fiery furnace went out. This is what's left. So all those fiery gases now are just kind of, you know, burned out. And what we see is the whole thing backlit by stars. And we're just seeing like the gases that are like the, the leftover carcass floating around. This is Messier 1, M1. So someday, Supernova 2023 IXF will become something like this. So that's kind of cool, isn't it? OK, back to um, our live view. Let's shut this down. 
and go to our next target. And you know there are about four targets I noticed. Let's go to now and run this. There are about four targets that we can do in the secret deep. Remember that secret deep list? And we've got a few leftovers. Uh, how many? 19, is it? I tell you what, let's... Um, Yeah, I think 19 that are here. That one's 25 degrees above the horizon. Let's go look at it now. It's a globular cluster. So, slew to it. So I don't know if you can hear that tonight. Since we're out in the observatory, now you're hearing the, the actual mount as it slews. So that's kind of cool. We don't normally we don't normally hear the scope when we're inside the uh, office, do we? I should put a microphone out here because it's kind of cool to hear the sound effect. I don't know is that this this focuser. I'm gonna change this right now to this. Um, this view and just show you right can you see that yeah right here right here is this uh, autofocuser celestron autofocuser and there is a power connection and it's good and how do we know that because i can see the pilot light is on and then there's a usb cable i suppose that usb cable could be bad so I'll tell you what I think I'm going to do. I think I'm going to run a new USB cable and I'm just going to run it with this with this cable which is coming directly from the 2600 and the um, uh, the little USB distributor that I have on top. I just gave up and I didn't run it through the scope you know, for this. I think I'll run the focuser through that as well because I think we're losing the focuser because it's coming through the mount. And I think Ioptron just didn't wire this mount correctly so it can handle all that data, I think. So that's what I'll do for next time. And it'll be a, a daytime project when I can rewire all that. Okay, let's now go to... Um, uh, back to our screen view and uh -huh. why why is that not letting me choose Tracking's on. So something's going awry with our, but there's that globular cluster. We can see it here in the frame anyway. But look how something's going awry with our, with our camera, hasn't it? We can't choose anything. Oh, I know why. It's saying, what's the name of the target? Uh, this is going to be um, NGC 6144. Okay, so now it's going to... Normally, this is up here on top. And because I have a new monitor, because I'm in a different monitor, see, it didn't... Um, It didn't remember to keep that up here on top. So what it's doing now is plate solving. 
and you guys that are uh, regulars on the channel, you know that plate solving is when uh, we take a picture of the sky and compare it to the picture in our data and then it's going to look at the records and it's going to figure out and right there the telescope, I could hear it since we're out in the observatory tonight, the telescope moved a little bit so it could uh, reposition itself and thereby find this supposed globular cluster. But I thought we were seeing it. If that's the globular cluster, it sure is loose. Let's see what you guys are saying. Michael. Talking about the overcast. Uh, Stu saw the Crab Nebula. In 900 years, M101, M1 will be twice as big. How about that? Because that gas is expanding, I guess, Stu. Slucam ASMR. <laughs> NGC 6144 is a globular cluster in the constellation Scorpius, located almost exactly one degree away from its brighter counterpart, globular cluster Messier 4. It remembers it from now on. So I'm going to rename the live stack, yes. Oh, look, there's the globular cluster. Okay, so let's re reset the uh, display histogram, and then let's reset the stacking histogram. Let's pull this. Boy, that is a bright star there, isn't it? What star do you suppose that is? We'll have to look that up. Let's move that just a little bit off that crest and then move these mids up just a little bit. And now let's zoom in on that globular cluster in the middle. So there is 100%. Ah, uh, yeah, now our, our focus is starting to let us down a little bit. So we're not going to be able to zoom past 40% tonight. And it reveals that the focus is just still average. So there is NGC 6144. Let's go to Stellarium. And um, NGC 6144. So the part of the sky we're looking at is due south. Sure enough, now I love this because now we can see, since we're out here in person, we can see, and your, your camera is mounted toward the north now with this webcam. So look how you're looking over the shoulder. You're looking over the shoulder as the telescope looks now due south, pretty south. Okay, so back to the screen. Um, so. That's my truck. You might be able to barely see my truck there. And sure enough, my truck is parked outside the observatory in exactly that same spot tonight. Now let's zoom in on this part of the sky and see what star that is. That's Antares. You remember Antares is the one that's, uh, it's, uh, it's sometimes confused with Mars because it's so orange. And doesn't Antares and Mars, there's something shared in the language background, if I remember right. I, I think one's Latin and one's Greek or whatever, I can't remember. But anyway, that's Antares. And look what a um, rich field this is in this part of the sky. Look how much nebulosity there is. Look at all that hydrogen. It's so big that it's this, this red rectangle is roughly the size of the Rasa's frame. So the Rasa camera on the end of the scope roughly has that size of a, of a field of view. The entire field of view is covered with orange nebulosity. And sure enough, if we go to our live view now, let's see. Is that here? Yeah, if we go to our live view and we back off some, there's the orange star Antares. 
and this entire background is probably actually all going to show up as that nebulosity if we let it run long enough. Look how there's a center, uh, a center oval, and then there's an outer oval. This is not a big glob, is it? Not a big globular cluster. Uh, it's a globular cluster in the constellation Scorpius. It's 33,000 light years away, Stu says, over three times farther away than the relatively near Messier 4. At that distance, it also appears over three times smaller. Antares is a double star, interestingly. Let's go uh, back off again and see. It's so bright. Whatever double is there, we're not able to discern it because they're mixed together. But is it my imagination? I think it looks a little more oval toward the top. So I bet you the double is up here at the top. Let's go out to Stellarium and zoom in on Antares. Yeah, the same thing's happening there. It's just completely obliterated with how bright it is. How bright is the magnitude for Antares? Oh, it's the Antares Nebula. What about the Antares Star? You can't click on the star without clicking on the nebula. I don't really like that. I wish it would let me choose the star. Well, anyway, Stu might be able to tell us what the magnitude of Antares is. 6144 is relatively close to and is part of, obscured by the Rho-Ophiuchi cloud complex. So this whole thing must be the Rho-Ophiuchi cloud. Or maybe, yeah, I bet this, I bet this whole thing is the Rho Ophiuchi. Oh, that's fascinating. Anyway, there's that globular cluster, 6144, right in the center. Otherwise known as Malat 147. Okay, so let's do an observation for this. And we're going to say... We love this cluster around 30,000, no, 33, 33,000 light years away. Um, relatively close, relatively close. And um, partly obscured by the Rho Ophiuchi cloud complex. Okay. Now the next globular cluster, this one's at 23 degrees. So let's go back over to our live view one more time and back off of here. Now we're seeing that globular cluster really well. But again, we can only zoom in about 40% before we, before it becomes painfully obvious that our focus is bad. <laughs> so we'll save this and then we'll go to next object. Antares is a slow, irregular variable star that ranges in brightness from an apparent visual magnitude of plus 0 0.6 down to plus 1.6. It is, on average, the 15th brightest star in the night sky. That's pretty bright. Remember that um, uh, magnitude scale 
is actually reversed. So are we slowing to oh I, I see. We stopped we need to stop this because I hadn't slewed to the next target yet. Okay, so now let's slew there to sixty two ninety three. Oh, it's close by. It's a very small slew. 6293. How do I stop this thing? Here we go. Now let's. Um, oh, here's this. Uh, on the wrong screen. Here's this 62.93. And if I was on the ball, I would go down here and say um, secret deep. And in the secret deep list, it's number 75, secret deep 75, NGC 6293, a globular cluster in Ophiuchus, Ophiuchus. Remember the good old days of twiddling a knob to change your focus, Stu says. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know, if we were operating out here, see, we could do that. But because this came with a knob. But man, I'm telling you, gang, let me just shoot straight with you. This telescope is so bad at focusing that with a knob, I don't know if I could even do it. It's so bad. Um, the, the, the range of focus is so narrow, it's the width of a human hair. And I'm talking about your grandmother's hair, not your hair. In other words, the thinnest hair you can imagine, 11 microns or something, I forget. It is crazy thin, and you almost have to have an automatic focuser to do it justice because it just does not work well. Oh yes, and look, here's another silly prompt that was down on the lower screen. Yes, the mount has settled. Uh, globular cluster 6293. Let's, uh, let's go over to that in the chart. They couldn't find Stellarium. So we're going to do it manually. I wonder why it couldn't find Stellarium. NGC 6293. So now we're in the same part of the sky, looking toward the south. There's the southern meridian. And we're off to the left. And look at this dark horse nebula. Isn't that cool if you turn your head sideways? Let's zoom in on that a little bit. Does that look like a Bronco, you know, out at the rodeo? Anyway, by the leg of the Bronco, the dark horse nebula here, is this globular cluster. And there it is, 6293. Now let's go over to the live view. So here's the live view. Okay, there you go. As soon as it's done with its thing here, it's already finished plate solving. I guess this is just a settling.
Oh yeah, it tries to do a white balance. Not convinced that it's very good at it. Um, nothing's working very perfectly tonight on the balance, the white balance. But there's this globular cluster. It's very tiny, isn't it? You know, I don't have the secret deep book out here. That's sad, isn't it? Uh, 6293 is a globular located in the constellation Ophiuchus. It was discovered by the American astronomer Lewis Swift on July 8, 1885. Fairly recent, huh? Like many other globular clusters, its distance is not well known. It may be anywhere from 31,000 to 52,000 light years from Earth. Mike, good to have you from Georgia checking in. Glad to have you here. Boy, it's starting to get cold out here, gang. What's the temperature? I'm gonna just take a look over here. You can tell I'm super spoiled. It's just 62 degrees, but this jacket is not enough for 62 degrees, I'm telling you. We're spoiled from working inside that office. Um, 6293, so this is about uh, 30 to 50,000 light years away. I don't know what uh, Stephen James O'Meara would be saying about this. I could go inside and get the book if you want, or we can just improvise. 6293, and we're gonna say uh, 30 to 40, Thousand light years, or to 50, 30 to 50,000 light years away. Fairly small. Uh, I bet it tells us the size. Yeah, eight arc minutes. Eight arc minutes of extent. Magnitude eight, so fairly bright. So that's 6293. It's pretty, isn't it? If it's rather small, but it's still pretty. Not a great night for photos, is it? Because that nasty focus. All right, we have another glob here in the secret deep list. Wow, several of these. about that? Maybe I should go get that book. Let's take a vote. Do you guys want me to go get the Secret Deep book? Lewis Swift discovered 13 comets and 1,248 previously uncatalogued nebulae. Only William Herschel discovered more nebulae visually. Wow. You know, I've heard of the Swift Comet Observatory or something, if I remember right. Let's take a vote. Who wants me to go get the secret deep book inside the office? It will take me approximately two minutes to run in there, I bet. But the good news is while I'm running in, we can be focusing on the next, can be finding the next object, so it won't be time lost. So let's wrap this up. Sequence. Next. Target cycle. Um, slew to it. This is 6309. NGC 6309. That wasn't very far away, was it? Did you hear the telescope move? Can you guys hear that? When the telescope moves? Um, Here's that little 6309. The imaging program we're using is SharpCap, and it has a, kind of a little programming deal built in. Uh, it's called a sequencer. 
Uh, and Stu says, get a warmer jacket. That's a great idea. Maybe a woolly hat. Kubota Man Dan says, sure, the run inside will warm you. You guys are so awesome. You're compassionate. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to leave this up here. So that can be, um, it'll automatically do everything while I go. Okay, off I go to grab that book. I'm going to lock the observatory when I leave because we don't want anybody to walk in and steal you guys. The last thing in the world would be to, if you guys get stolen. Okay, so I'm outside the door, locking the door. Now eventually, as I walk away, the mic, the mic will lose its connection, sadly. So now I'm at my truck. And this is where I can get the warmer, the warmer uh, clothing. Fortunately, I have some extra clothing in here from soccer. Let's see what I have. I can get, um... oh good, here's a sweater. Do I need a full blown sweater? I think a sweater would do it. It's like a, a layer for winter soccer is what it is. Now it is gonna cover up the mic. I'm gonna move the mic to the outside of the sweater. And then somebody said get a woolly hat. So I'm gonna get a hat. I'm gonna listen to your guys' input. Let's see. Where's a nice hat? Here's a hat. Not too thick. Oh, that feels so much better. You guys are a compassionate crew. Now I'm headed to the office so the sure the This is a building, observatory, aluminum particles. So I think that impedes the signal a little bit. But so now I'm outside, unlocking it, coming in, and then I have this inside lock too, because I thought, well, that's kind of spooky if somebody would just walk in on you. So I have an inside lock. <clears throat> so I can lock myself in. Okay, I'm back. 
Uh, let's see what we got here. Boy, it's setting the mid-level so close. And for some reason it brought the white level. Well, I don't see anything there. Do you guys? Oh, it's a planetary nebula. Wow, it's right there in the middle and it is so tiny. We're not going to be able to see it very well because of this silly focus issue. Yeah, I'll see. Once you get past 45%, we, um, we lose focus, but right there it is in the middle. That's almost not worth it, is it? Uh, oh, it's the box nebula. Mm, let me read what you guys wrote. Yes, we hear the scope move. Well, that's cool. Yes, buzz sounds. NGC 6309, also known as the Box Nebula, is a planetary nebula. Let me fix the title. That's sad when I forget to change the title, right? This is NGC 6309, a planetary nebula. Um, it's a Box Nebula planetary nebula located in the constellation Ophiuchus. It was discovered by the German astronomer William Temple. In 1876, has a luminosity of 1,800 times that of the sun. The distance of this nebula is not well known, but is assumed to be at 6,500 light years. Okay. This is Secret Deep 76. Uh, although small, he says it's rewarding because it encourages the judicious use of high power. It uh, wasn't discovered till uh, the 1800s, and he talks about William Temple. He discovered it with an 11 inch refractor in Florence, it must be Italy. Tells you how to find it. It looks like a fuzzy double star. Yeah, see how it's it's a double. It looks like a planetary nebula side by side with a little star, doesn't it? If you can make it out, it's so tiny because I can't zoom in very much. A fainter bead lies midway along the eastern rim. Oh yeah. I don't know if you can get your eyes really close. Can you get your eyes really close to the screen and see there's a little bitty tiny bead here, which is for us on top. He says, I wondered if this were not the central star. And um, he says it's easy to miss. It's sometimes known as the exclamation mark. I guess because it's so oblong, and in that star to the left, looks like the dot of the exclamation mark. That's pretty cool, huh? Boy. It's only five... Is that right? Five arc seconds? No, 16 arc seconds. Still, that's probably the smallest object we've ever tried to observe, isn't it? Have we looked at 
anything that small before, 16 arc seconds. Only 16 arc seconds of extent. Some 6,500 light years away, it is thought. Um, luminosity, 1,800 times that of the sun. It's a quadrupolar, quadrupolar nebula with two pairs of lobes surrounding the pair as a spherical shell. Surrounded by a spherical shell. The exclamation mark nebula. You know, this is 6309. Let's go out to um, the web real quick. 6309. Where is the web? I've lost it. Did I close it? No, there it is. 6309. Let's see if we've got anything on it. NGC 6309. Because that would be a cool picture with a, a Hubble telescope or something. Uh, not as good as I thought. 6309. So it doesn't look much like an exclamation mark in this view, does it? I think I was expecting for this part here to be taller and that to be the dot of the exclamation mark. See, I thought this, this part here would look a little taller in a Hubble-type view, but it doesn't. But it is cool, isn't it, that that star is right there beside it, kind of helping light it up. Look, you can see the central star in this Hubble-type view. We don't have nearly enough detail. Now, I wonder, can you see the star that is off to the north of it? No. This evidently is too close of an image, right? Or else maybe that star is actually kind of this puff here. I think, I guess. Anyway, it's a neat structure, isn't it? Very cool. Uh, so this is the outer lobe, or outer shell, I mean. And then we can't really see the inner lobes very well, but boy, it doesn't look like a normal planetary nebula, does it? I wonder who did this picture. Based on observations made with the NASA ESA Hubble, yeah. Well, there you go. Let's tuck that around behind. No sense in saving a picture here, but I'll do it anyway. Um, so that's 6356. I'm sorry, 6309. Now let's stop the sequence, this live stacking, and let's go to 6356. NGC 6356. Well, that was sure a short slew, wasn't it? <laughs> um, got about 19 minutes left so hopefully 
Let's hit a few more of these secret deep targets. We're not going to be able to get to the um, cosmic challenge tonight. One thing I thought we ought to do while this is um, while this is doing its thing is one more time we ought to talk about this idea of um, arc minutes and arc seconds. So pretend like you know, we're out here now under the open sky. So from, from that horizon over, that's east, over to the west, we can see half the sky, roughly. So that's 180 degrees. So just hold your fist out at arm's length, and it's approximately 10 degrees. So you think about the fist, and then divide your fist up into one degree increments. So a tenth of your fist, what would that be like? Maybe the width of your little finger, maybe? I don't know, smaller. So at arm's length, whatever that is, a tenth of a fist, that would be one degree. Now divide your little finger into 60 sections. 60 slices, and every one of those would be an arc minute. So when we say something is 15 arc minutes, it means 15 of those little 60 slices from your little finger at arm's length. Now, take one of those arc minutes and divide it into 60 arc seconds. <laughs> so when we say something is 60 arc seconds wide, it is super, super tiny because we took one degree divided in 60 minutes, took one minute divided in 60 seconds, and when we say extent of sky, it's like the angular width of that. So imagine if, if we're taking something, we're saying it's 10 degrees extent. It means it occupies 10 degrees of our, of our angle of our sky, see? So 16 arc seconds is like the tiniest speck you can imagine in this 11-inch telescope. It's so small. Okay, back to our screen. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? That's beautiful after we get everything tuned. Yeah, there's nothing like a beautiful globular cluster to remind you of, you know, Christmas time or it always makes me think of those old-fashioned Christmas lights. This is 6356. What can you tell us about 6356, Stu? It's secret deep number 77. We miss all these. I guess they just weren't up yet in that last season. Sixty three fifty six. Sixty three fifty six. Still in Ophiuchus. Reasonably bright. Um, 10 arc minutes of extent. So, 180 degrees. Take one degree, slice it in 60 slices. And we're talking about 10 of those little slices of a degree divided into 60. So, pretty small deal. Metal rich globular cluster discovered by the late 
Jack Bennett? Sounds like some kind of a famous movie star. No, that's Jack Benny. Famous old fashioned movie star. Um, moderately condensed cluster. Core is less intense, like a soft wad of cotton. A comet that has lost its nucleus and now begin to fade. The outer region breaks up into foggy patches. Star clumps and some of the cluster's brightest members shining around 15th magnitude. Pretty fun. What you got, Stu? 6356. NGC 6356. Discovered. Oh, you're, you're saying it's discovered by Herschel. Bright core, patchy at the um, outer sh outer layers or outer ring, outer extremities, we'll say. Metal rich globular. Yeah, I think. A lot of these globulars have metal, don't they? Don't astronomers use metal to mean anything that's not hydrogen or helium, if I remember right. So in other words, all of your carbon and sulfur and anything like um, Anything heavier than hydrogen, they just call it metals. I don't know why they got started doing that. It's kind of confusing, isn't it? Okay, that's NGC, NGC 6356. Let's go to, let's see, we got 10 minutes left. Let's go to, Target uh, 60. Wow, we're getting lower, lower altitudes now. Well, no, here's a 35, 35 degrees. Let's go to the 6756. Sixty-seven fifty-six. Boy, we're lucky that our focus is even this close, aren't we? Because think of how much the temperatures dropped just tonight. It's dropped probably, um, what is it now? Well, still, still 62, I guess. So it's dropped 10 degrees. Azray, you made it. Hey, uh, Ray, you got a family, you had a family thing, sorry. Sorry that happened, but thanks for popping in. Um, you had some kind of family emergency, I think you said. 6756. 6756. And this is a globular cluster. The last one was too. I think I left Planetary Nebula up there. So sorry. Small open star cluster in Aquila. 
I don't see it. You know, uh, I've got a chair out here. Oh my goodness, the, the chair is all wet now. I should have covered it up, shouldn't I? It's wet from the dew. I don't think I'm going to sit in that. It's just going to be so chilly. I might just to see what it feels like to be sitting at this computer. How do you... Ah, this is okay. I think we can get used to this, gang. As long as we dress up a little bit warmer. Oh, right there it is in the middle, huh? I'd be interested in your guys' uh, take on the difference in uh, doing the <clears throat> astronomy inside the office compared to here. 50 Fahrenheit in New Zealand, in Tuaranga. Tuaranga, where Stu is. Hosing down and dismal. Glad you have clear skies. Yeah, me too, finally. Open star cluster. So is this, oh, it's an open cluster. It's not a globular. Get my stuff together here. Open cluster. Okay. 6756. Small open cluster in Aquila. Oh no. Ray. We are so sorry. You, you had a daughter pass away last night. What was her name, Ray? We are so sorry to hear this. I mean, this is a, an example of the way you can build a community over a, an astronomy channel because I, I've never met you except for on this channel, yet my heart aches for you. Um, no father should have to bury his daughter, and we are so sorry. What is her name? We are going to dedicate this. Uh, I'll put that in the in the description that we're dedicating this live stream to her. We are so sorry to hear this. I'm kind of waiting to hear her name, Ray. Tiffany says, so sorry, God bless her dear soul. Angela, would you all mind? I don't think you'll mind. Lord, I just want to pause for a second and pray for Ray and for all of his family at the loss they've experienced in Angela. And we know that this is a part of life, but it still right now bites. And please lift Ray up, all of his family members, encourage them and Thank you for Angela's life. All the people who knew her and loved her, would you please encourage them right now and send angels to stand beside them and lift them up and help them with all the arrangements and everything they have to do, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so sorry, brother. Okay. Doesn't feel like we should doing more astronomy tonight. Um, we'll just wrap up this 6756 open cluster in Aquila. It's uh, secret deep 88 and um, call it a night at that.
Oh, you can see two clusters here, 87 and 88. It's possible that they're a binary cluster. What? Oh, is the other one right here, maybe? Yeah, 87 and 88. Uh, there are only, of the 1,600 open clusters in our galaxy, astronomers only have recognized one as being a true double, uh, the double cluster. But there are 18 probable, and this is one of them. So sure enough, Make sure we're seeing the right thing here. So that's 88. And this must be 87, otherwise known as 6755. Let's go out to Stellarium. 6755. 6755 MGC 6755 and 6756 so 56 Not much of this cluster to see, is there? I don't know if I could pick that out. Let's go back over here and um, solve only, just to make sure we're looking at the right thing. Um, she had many problems, but is at rest now. Angela's supernova now. Michael one Eden praying. Totally don't mind. Go ahead. Thanks, Doug. Mike, amen. Stu said amen. Tiffany said amen. Stu said amen. As Ray, thanks for your prayers. Peace be to you, dear Ray. Thank you, Tiffany. It's like we're a family, huh? Uh, now let's go tools and um, deep sky image annotation. Okay, so there you have it, the confirmation. This is 6756, which is what we originally were looking at, and then 6755 is barely discernible up here as a cluster. There are so many background stars, but there's 6755. possible binary cluster with 6755. And 6755 is the next cluster. So we'll also write possible binary with 6756. Only one recognized true binary cluster, the double cluster, and 18 other possible clusters, binary clusters. This is one of them. Okay, well, let's see that. Uh, push the ball down the field a little farther. We have 
19 objects left in the secret deep list. Uh, just want to thank you guys for being with us tonight. We spent about an hour on that supernova, but I think that's fitting because uh, we don't get to see supernovae very often, do we? And then this last uh, 45 minutes or so, we hit a few more in our list called The Secret Deep, a list by Stephen James O'Meara. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, this has been like a shakedown cruise for us operating from the on-site screen, you know, insulation. It's kind of nice. We've got all the cables here to plug the laptop in. And they had been here, we just hadn't done it yet because we uh, set it all up in the winter. Uh, one thing I want to work on is uh, trying to get connection again to this focuser. We've got to fix that. So I'll work on that, Lord willing, some this weekend and get that ready for next time. Um, other than that, the telescope performed flawlessly. The, uh, the focus was close enough for us to get by even at 50%. Uh, it was warmer between 72 and 62. But boy, thanks to you guys for suggesting that I put on something warmer when I went to get the book. This wraps up our live stream tonight. If you've never subscribed to the channel, we'd like to invite you to do that. You could also click the thumbs up button, the like, and then if you click that bell, you'll be notified when we do live streams like this in the future. You can also go to emeraldhillskies.com and sign up to be notified by email if you'd rather. We usually do those emails about 24 hours or 48 hours in advance once we see a stable weather pattern. We'd love to have you stop back. It's kind of a community. I think you could see that tonight. I want to thank all you guys for participating. It's always nice to have uh, Stu, you're looking things up for us. Uh, Ray, with your uh, experience in astronomy as well. But tonight, we're sorry for your loss again. Uh, Stu talked about this uh, binary cluster, and he says, maybe they're not. Stu says, bring on Betelgeuse. <laughs> thank you all for being a part of this. We'll say good night for now. Uh, hope to see you again on the next one. We'll let you know by email and also on the YouTube channel. You'll see that pop up. Thanks for joining us our first night to really observe from the observatory itself. God bless. Have a good evening. We'll say good night.